to talk about uh, advertising puzzles. And there are three questions I want to ask. Why would a company, company give away a jigsaw puzzle to someone who buys its product? Who actually manufactured the advertising puzzles? Which advertising puzzles are most collectible? And then I'm going to show you a few of my personal favorites. So let's, uh, let me mention at the beginning that there were two big puzzle crazes before the pandemic. Uh, there, there was one during the Great Depression. It was very similar because people had no money. They couldn't go out. Um, they were looking for home-based entertainment. They weren't getting sick, fortunately, uh, but uh, it, it was a very similar kind of phenomenon where a lot of people were homebound and looking for inexpensive entertainment. And the previous one was at the beginning of the 20th century where there was a financial crisis and it was, um, uh, puzzles took off, again, because they were relatively inexpensive entertainment. And so most of the examples I'm going to show you are from those two periods. There are others, of course. So, why give away a puzzle for free? Well, it turns out that if you give someone something free with a puzzle, uh, something free with a product, they're willing to pay more for the product. And the best example I know of comes from the Great Depression. It was July of 1932. The Depression was about to enter its fourth year. Everybody was, had either lost income or they feared they were going to lose income. And they were very, they were pinching their pennies. Even the demand for toothbrushes slipped a lot. So the prophylactic brush company, which was located in Florence, Massachusetts, um, they later shortened the name to ProBush, um, gave away this puzzle to buyers of toothbrushes. They, may, they had a big advertising campaign, and uh, they raised the price of their toothbrushes by four cents, from 25 cents to 29 cents. And their sales quadrupled within a couple of months. Now that's pretty weird that you raise your price, sales quadrupled, but they got this great puzzle. Now, that comes to the second reason cardboard puzzles are very cheap to produce. And most of the advertising puzzles are indeed cardboard puzzles. Uh, I'm, uh, Pro Brush paid less than two cents per puzzle, so that's a clear two cents profit on basically a 25 cent product uh, multiplied, multiplied by um, a million. So that's, that was pretty big money back then. A sec another reason why uh, people like, like to give away advertising puzzles, particularly in the past, is that print advertisement is something that um, goes by most people very quickly. It's in a magazine, a newspaper, you turn the page, you read what you're interested in, you turn the page, the ad doesn't stick with you. The same thing is true now with the internet, unless you're clicking through to a product, you only look at that for, what, three seconds? Uh, but a puzzle, you're looking at that puzzle for at least half an hour in order to put it together. So it's got some staying power that some other advertising does not have. Another reason for giving away a puzzle is uh, multiple sales to the same buyer. This is a fly part of a flyer from one of the companies that produced advertising puzzles. And I want um, to show you, um, notice they, this would be the front of the envelope where they printed the name of the, um, of the uh, manufacturer, the consumer product and the address. And on the back, it says how to play jigsaw puzzles. Over here on the right, it says jigsaw contest. And the first instruction is each player has to have his or her own puzzle. Okay, so that means you have to go buy multiple products to get multiple puzzles so you can run your contest. 
The second uh, thing here is have a jigsaw puzzle party. Here's a swell new idea. Furnish each of your guests with a picture puzzle. Another reason is that you can build a mailing list if that's what you want to do. You don't give away the product, the puzzle with the product. The consumer has to send in proof of purchase, three box tops, whatever. And uh, this Hood Sarsaparilla puzzle, those of you from New England probably know that the Hood Sarsaparilla puzzle was in Lowell, just down the road. Uh, they made this uh, patent medicine that they developed in the 1900s. It had sarsaparilla, assorted herbs. Uh, it claimed to cure everything, cancer, boils, uh, sciatica, uh, scrofula, whatever that is. Um, you know, just uh, headaches, you name it. It really didn't help with any of those things except that it was 18% alcohol. And a lot of people felt better after, <laughs> after taking their hood sarsaparilla. <laughs> then I just discovered a new reason for uh, a, an advertising puzzle. Um, if you've tried to buy a new car recently, you have to wait in line for the car to get, off the, get out of the factory and into the uh, dealership. And Cooper Mini, uh, Mini Cooper um, decided that they were going to keep their customers happy. But while, while they're waiting, they sent them a, a great big puzzle of a Mini Cooper that they could assemble and put on the floor of their garage until the car came. <laughs> um, I, I'm tempted to order Mini Cooper just to get the puzzle. <laughs> Now, who actually manufactured the advertising puzzles for the companies that gave them away? Well, Mini Cooper isn't making puzzles. Uh, yeah. uh, so they subcontracted the production to another company. And there were a few wooden uh, advertising puzzles. This one um, was made by the R&J Specialty Company of New York City um, in about 1908. It advertises the Lackawanna Railroad, which ran at least from New York City to Buffalo. And the Lackawanna's advertising slogan at that time was, the Lackawanna was the road of anthracite. Now, not, coal is a failing industry, but uh, it turns out that when, in 1908, there were no diesel engines, steam engines. Now, how do you get a steam engine to go? You need steam, how do you get the steam? You burn coal. There, were, there are at least two types of coal. There's soft coal and there's anthracite. Anthracite is a hard coal that generates very little ash, very little soot, um, very few embers that are going to fly back into the car and dirty your clothes. So the Lackawanna had Phoebe Snow. Uh, here, uh, their imaginary uh, passenger, their spokeswoman. And this is a jingle that they were uh, promoting at the time, says Phoebe Snow, about to go upon a trip to Buffalo, my gown stays white from morn to night upon the road of anthracite. <laughs> Most of the uh, tradition, the makers of advertising puzzles, as they said, were uh, cardboard. The biggest was Einstein Freeman. It stamped out, it was, in February of 1933, it was stamping out three million puzzles a week. Most of those were uh, advertising puzzles. This is a time when there are only 30 million households in the United States, so that's a pretty amazing production figure. This is a photo of their factory that appeared in Fortune magazine in, I think, March of 1933. Uh, this is an example of an Einstein Freeman uh, puzzle that they made for Westinghouse Mazda. Westinghouse Mazda at the time was making light bulbs and you would buy some light bulbs, you'd get a free puzzle. Here's the puzzle. Now, if you look across the top, and if you're close enough, you might be able to see that there are pieces that spell out the word Mazda. And then down the diagonal, there are pieces that spell out Westinghouse. Um, they're very much harder to see. And um, George, they had a series of pictures of George Washington 
because 1932 was the bicentennial George Washington's birth. So a lot of these early 30s puzzles have George Washington pictures on them. And then they also had a lot of other figure pieces that um, you know, were just sort of standard figure pieces of animals and what have you. Einstein Freeman also sold stock puzzles. This was uh, an envelope for a stock puzzle that you could, that gave the name of the company and its products and um, where it was located. And then this is just a, a picture. They had a whole range of pictures, so many, many different companies would have ordered this particular picture uh, with their label, with the envelope printed, with their information to give away. Now, some of the advertising puzzles were leftovers. Does anyone recognize this puzzle? Nobody? Oh, come on. Uh, well, it, it is a cardboard puzzle. Um, this is a surplus Jig of the Week. Jig of the Week was one of the biggest producers of puzzles in the Depression. And uh, again, we have George Washington. And the Depression puzzle craze really came to an abrupt stop in April of 1933. Uh, University Distributing Company was stuck with a lot of extra puzzles. So it then uh, resold them, or didn't, well, sold them for the first time to companies that wanted to give away an advertising gift, of advertising premium. And this one, oops, was given away by Salada Tea, and uh, University Distributing simply put a new label on the box that says, it still has the 25 cent price on it, but it, down here it says compliments of Salada Tea. So you felt really good because you were getting something worth 25 cents, um, and you were getting it for free. Sometimes the puzzlers themselves had to make the puzzles. So the Boston Globe in 1908 had these cardboard, uh, thin cardboard uh, uh, prints uh, that they inserted in the newspapers. They had cutting lines superimposed on the picture, and the instructions were get out your scissors, cut it up, and then put it back together. Okay, so make the puzzler do the work. And then we had something similar in 1921. Uh, the company that made gold medal flour took out an ad in the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, it's just a printed page. And uh, so this is a paper puzzle. It's, uh, you can see all the pieces are triangular and the instructions are the same. Get out your scissors, uh, cut it up, reassemble it. And then gold medal, if you sent it back assembled to gold medal flower, they would send you a pin cushion shaped like a sack of gold medal flower. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that you know many, many thousands of people sent back the assembled puzzles. About 300 of them had questions. Well, how do I do? How do I bake this? You know, I, you know, my cake is rising. What should I do? And um, the, the General Mills, actually it was a predecessor, the Washburn Crosby Company, uh, they said, ooh, this is an opportunity. So they uh, delegated one of their employees to answer all these cooking questions. And uh, the employees, who, there, I think there were a couple, they had to have really good handwriting, and they signed their letters, Betty Crockett. Um, and this is, Betty Crockett is still with us over 100 years. She's still a spokesperson for General Mills, and her name is on lots of products. Um, and I want to say a word about pseudo-advertising. Uh, advertising puzzle collectors make a distinction between a pseudo-advertising puzzle and a real advertising puzzle. The distinction is whether or not you pay for it. So a true advertising puzzle comes to you for free. A pseudo-advertising puzzle is one that um, you don't pay for, you don't, you don't have to shell out money for the puzzle itself. Uh, this was a puzzle made by Charles Russell. He lived 10 miles away in Auburn. He was a, a professional puzzle maker in the Depression and later. He found this um, poster for the uh, uh, bookshelf, a lending library in Worcester. I like it because they also lent out puzzles back then. He pasted it onto wood, he cut it up and he sold it. 
Today we have a lot of licensing. So you can buy a product um, that has an image on it that is licensed by, the, uh, by some other um, company. So for example, the Campbell Soup Company in the 1980s licensed the use of the Campbell kids on jigsaw puzzles for children to JMAR puzzles. So this looks like an advertising puzzle, but it's, you really had to buy it. Uh, JMAR was not giving them away for free. And then there's some sort of weird ones. Um, I don't know who made this, um, but it was someone who probably worked in a hardware store and got this piece of wallboard that would have been displayed in the window of the store, took it home, took a calendar picture, pasted it onto the back, and now we have a double-sided puzzle uh, that um, uh, is advertising on one side and a calendar picture on the other. Uh, personally, I don't make that big of a difference between the true advertising puzzles and the pseudo-advertising puzzles, but um, it's really a matter of choice as to whether you do that. Now, which advertising puzzles are the most collectible? Some are cross-collectible. So, uh, if you collect model trains, you might want that Phoebe Snow puzzle of, this, of the steam train. If you collect old bottles, you might want a hood sarsaparilla bottle, and uh, you have, might have a room full of hood sarsaparilla bottles, and you want that hood's auto race puzzle. And if you, or you might want the Borden's, if you collect milk bottles, you want the Borden's puzzle. So they, they simply enhance another collection. But most of them, uh, most people who, there are people who collect strictly advertising puzzles and they go for certain things. Fun graphics is one of the things they go for. And here we have an Esso motor oil puzzle. Esso was the predecessor of Exxon. And um, the, you got this if you bought a can of Esso motor oil. And you can see the, the happy motorist uh, and his family waving goodbye to the jungle that's filled with monsters that are gonna attack their car. Um, anyone recognize the artist? Yeah, Dr. Seuss. Dr. Dr. Seuss, it's Dr. Seuss. And he, was, uh, he would, lived a few miles away on the west side of, this, of Sturbridge. And uh, before he got into children's books, which I believe was in the late 40s, he was a well-known commercial artist, did a lot of advertising work for Esso. One of the fun things about this puzzle is it comes in an envelope that describes these monsters, which, you know, you could, those, some of those monsters look just like what appear in his books. So here we have the Moto Munches and the Oilo Gobulus. And the Carbonacus. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just love this puzzle. It's, it's so great. Sometimes people collect, like to just learn about old products that no longer exist. How many of you have made bread? So, you know it takes a while. You have to mix the dough, you have to let it rise, you uh, punch it down, you knead it, you let it rise again, you form it into loaves, you bake it. It's a lot of time. Uh, back around 1908, Tip Top was advertising that their bread uh, saved hours in the kitchen, which was true. Chicken dinner, um, how many of you have heard of chicken dinner candy bars? <laughs> I, I had never heard of them, but they were very popular from the 20s to the, uh, to the uh, late 60s. And uh, they were both wholesome and nourishing. We have Cinderella frocks for girl, little, it says children, but I think they're for little girls. Um, we have this lovely lady, she came with a pack of Turkish Trophy cigarettes. Um, and uh, that was around 1908. And in the 30s, uh, the Superior Biscuit Company uh, used Red Arrow as their um, uh, symbol. Uh, of course, people always like puzzles with high values. Uh, the Keen Cutter puzzle, oh, and me, I, I, haven't, I don't have one of these, so if you ever see one, let me know. Um, uh, the Keen Cutter Company was out in St. Louis, E.C. Simmons um, Cutlery, 
And I've never seen one of these puzzles for less than $300 or so. But the, the king of them all is the King Kong puzzle, which was issued at the same time as the movie in 1933. I have never seen this one for un complete and with the envelope for under $1,500. So let me know when you find spot one of these. For, for less than $1,500, of course. Um, now, I'm just going to quickly go through some of my own favorites. Um, I like the old ones. This is, I believe, the oldest true advertising puzzle that I know of. It was issued by a department store in St. Louis. Uh, in eight, around 1887. I haven't been able to find out much information on it, but it mentions the Christmas department on the label on the back of the box. And, uh, sorry, that's the label up here. Uh, it's on the back of the box. And um, so I'm guessing that Santa Claus gave away um, this puzzle in the toy department. Um, then we have a whole, a lot of puzzles that fall under the uh, range of silent teacher puzzles. Uh, these were made in upstate New York. They typically had a map on one side and advertising on the other. So these are really pseudo-advertising puzzles. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't know who, um, what the commercial arrangements were, but you had to pay a dollar to get one of these puzzles. And uh, you might be able to see that the map on the back of, the, of this puzzle is the map of New York State. Uh, the map on the back of this one is the world. That's a little harder to figure out. Uh, I, there's some advertising puzzles that have just intrigued me, and the, the Sing Sing Prison Puzzle is this one. Uh, it was distributed by Sloan's Liniment, and I thought, well, you know, maybe after a hard day on the, on the rock pile or the, or the work detail, the inmates wanted, used a lot of Sloan's liniment. Wait a minute, I'm going to come, come back to this. Do you have a question or a comment? Um, and I, so I really, that baffled me. And then I, I noticed that there's a little inset up here in the corner. And this is Warden Lewis E. Laws. He was a very progressive uh, prison administrator for his time. He made a lot of reforms at Sing Sing. He wrote a book called 20,000 Years in Sing Sing, in which he relate, related all these stories of prisoners who had been so perfectly rehabilitated during their years on the rock pile that they were then released back into the community as very productive citizens. And the, this actually book then became a radio program of the same title uh, during the 1930s, and Warden Laws uh, would talk about these, essentially he would tell the same stories from his book and news stories too. And Sloan's Liniment was the radio program sponsor. So that answers that puzzle. Um, now, you could get a free puzzle at the Fitkin Memorial Hospital. Now, you know, back in the, in the 30s, you had to stay in the hospital a long time if you were sick. They, they didn't um, release you to a rehab unit or anything like that. And it could get a little tedious uh, if you were past the crisis and feeling better, but they weren't gonna let you out yet. So you could do a puzzle. If you didn't, if unfortunately you never made it out of the hospital, um, except uh, feet first, uh, then you could get, your family could get a puzzle at the, at the Yells <laughs> funeral party. Uh, and um, this is another one that I, I just, you know, I looked at the, the scout up here on the cliff, looking at the, at the covered wagon um, train down here, and I'm thinking, you know, there's a massacre in the making, or there's some kind of conflict. Um, and of course, that, that means more work for the funeral parlors. Um, I like the unusual shapes. This is uh, one of the earliest puzzles, I, if not the earliest, I know of with dropouts. It's uh, shaped like a coffee pot. There are several pieces that are sh also shaped like coffee pots within the puzzle. Uh, the Wilson's ham puzzle leaves you in no doubt as to what the product is. The Victor Talking Machine Company, which later became RCA, uh, they issued this Victrola puzzle in 1922, uh, I believe. 
it has all the famous recording stars, so uh, especially a lot of opera stars, Alma Gluck, uh, Nelly Melba, uh, Caruso, Heifetz, all the other recording stars. And in the center of the puzzle, there's actually a little tiny circular piece. Rep so you can put this on your turntable if you want to. Uh, it, won't, it won't play, though. Uh, and more recently, at the, at the 2001 Toy Fair, I, uh, at the Lionel train booth, I picked up this little, um, little miniature train puzzle. I like the cautionary tales. Uh, this is some life insurance story of poor Betty. <laughs> Betty was very young. Her father had the opportunity to buy life insurance. Couldn't swing it at the time. Died suddenly, shortly thereafter. Betty's mom had to go to work in the, fa on, in the factory on the, on the assembly line, got almost no pay. You know, they planned for Betty to go to college, but Betty's gonna barely make it out of eighth grade, and she's gonna have to go to the factory too. Um, the personal finance company puzzle is one of the only ones that I know that came out during the Depression that really reflects the situation of the Depression. And Ethel here is confiding to Grace that um, Harry, um, uh, I think his name is Harry, yeah, Harry, um, his hours were cut back because of the Depression, so obviously he got paid less, the bills were piling up, she just didn't know what to do. Uh, and um, Grace tells her about the personal finance company. Last panel, all the problems are solved. <laughs> I like puzzle-related images. This one was made by Aptus Puzzles in New York State, in, near Rochester in 1991. This is a uh, Ingersoll Rand made water jet uh, equipment and for cutting puzzles. Uh, well, actually for industrial cutting of all sorts, but it was used, water jets were used for cutting puzzles in the 80s and 90s. After that, more, it was just much easier and cheaper to use lasers. But when Ingersoll Rand was advertising these uh, systems, uh, they'd give you a huge brochure and it had a little uh, three inch high puzzle included in it. And this, this tiny little puzzle has 143 pieces. And then there are a lot of films that have Jigsaw in the title or a Jigsaw theme and uh, this, uh, puzzle was probably sent to theater managers to encourage them to um, order up the Jigsaw Murders. Uh, what better way to advertise the Jigsaw Murders than with a Jigsaw puzzle? I've learned a lot of historical tidbits. Shell Oil uh, made this puzzle and gave it out away with uh, their gasoline. And down at the bottom here, you see a reference to Doolittle and Hazlip. Jimmy Doolittle and, and James Hazlip were early aviators, um, uh, one of the things at the time was to fly cross country to have a race and see, you know, which plane would get there fastest, which, which aviation fuel was performing the best, and Shell sponsored them in these races for, for many years. Doolittle, Doolittle became famous in World War II for the raid on Tokyo in early 1942. Um, shortly after Pearl Harbor. He did almost no damage, but it raised morale in the United States tremendously uh, at the beginning of, uh, at our beginning of World War II. And then I, I, when I was putting this slideshow together, I, I noticed this billboard in the back and it says 1933 new Shell gasoline on three cents a gallon. Uh, and there are a lot of pieces cut like, like Shell's logo. This puzzle was given away by Singer in, around 1908, and it reflects the view of, um, of most people at that time that Western civilization had brought great benefits to Native Americans. Uh, that, I think we've had a somewhat more enlightened view of the overall situation since then, um, but I, it's, it's still a very interesting puzzle to me. There were a lot of patriotic themes on puzzles. Pratt food, you've probably never heard of Pratt food, but that's because you didn't raise chickens or pigs or other animals on your farm in, 
in the early part of the 20th century, they marketed their Pratt's food using Uncle Sam as their spokesman in um, 1909. And then we have Tip Top Bread again during the 1940s. They issued a series of patriotic puzzles. Uh, this is the capital of Washington. They also had puzzles of the military academies, um, Annapolis and, and West Point. Uh, I have some, or I had some that were political promotions. Um, a two-piece wooden elephant for um, a Republican senator and a, um, a Frank Horton puzzle. He was uh, a congressman from upstate New York. He could have either given these away on the campaign trail or he could have kept a stack in his office when his constituents came in to say hi and they brought their children and he'd give the kids, you know, a little free puzzle. Santa, um, uh, Macy's Thanksgiving parade started in 1927. In 1932, they gave away this free puzzle of, uh, of um, the parade designed by Tony Stark. He was also the artist who designed the parade balloons in the first, um, I think for uh, up until World War II, um, he was the one who was designing the balloons. Uh, the Ever Ready uh, Battery Corporation, uh, they had a whole series of advertising images showing people uh, with a, a flashlight. You know, of course, there were Ever Ready batteries in the flashlight, uh, uh, trying to figure out something of importance in their lives. Uh, I like the, the dual purpose puzzles. Uh, the Toddy uh, Malted Milk Company uh, gave away, uh, with its uh, malted milk, it gave away this puzzle. It came in a, uh, a box. Uh, this, there was a spinner in the box. And, but you couldn't play the game until after you'd assembled the board, which was a jigsaw puzzle. Some puzzles had gimmicks. Uh, you know, there were a lot of puzzles flying around and you sort of had to stick out in some way. Our Gang Gum, uh, these are four Our Gang Gum puzzles. Each one came in a pack of gum. The series had 40, uh, each, is, each is a little miniature puzzle. There were 40 puzzles in the series. If you bought 40 packs of gum, and if you were lucky, because you couldn't see which puzzle was inside the pack, um, then you would have an entire panorama of a circus. Uh, and then in the 80s and 90s, Don Russ baseball cards adopted this principle for its um, Hall of Fame, Diamond King Hall of Fame puzzles. And uh, the Hank Aaron puzzle has 63 pieces. Each pack of, of, of um, each pack has uh, three pieces in it. Uh, each pack of trading cards, and you had to get 21 of the right packs of trading cards to um, finish this puzzle. And then there are just some sort of ones that struck me as a little improbable. Um, the, uh, this puzzle um, was, was just a printed piece of cardboard. Up here there are a couple little loops that would have held a lollipop. The lollipop is long gone, so I stuck in a Tootsie Pop. Um, and then when you're uh, down here, we have a perforated uh, puzzle that you can uh, pull the pieces apart and you have a 10 or 15 piece puzzle. This is a more modern puzzle from the 20th century. It's from Dominion en Energy. It's a paper napkin die cut into a puzzle with environmental messages. Uh, recycle, paper and plastic, um, you know, don't leave the water running, turn off the lights when you leave the room, all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, they tell us that paper napkins are not recyclable, they gum up, they gum up everything, the machinery. But this one has seeds in it, you can see little dots. So they said, you know, plant this, this paper napkin and watch your garden grow. And then my last example uh, is from this, the 70s. The Williams Rubber Company, no relation to me as far as I know. Um, it came with a, a pack of condoms. Uh, and uh, I'm not showing you the actual puzzle. It's, um, there's small children in the room. Uh, but uh, it's to learn anatomy the fun way. <laughs> so, thank you. I've lost track of
for the time. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Any questions? Five minutes. Yes. Does the same same puzzle come with a file? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to make your own. <laughs> yes. I noticed that the uh, that the Cinderella puzzle was actually from Alice in Wonderland. Yes. Humpty Dumpty was Humpty sitting there in the back too. Hatter, you know. It was sort of a melange of different things. Any other questions? Well, great. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. I just, I'm, and do you remember the, the Boston Globe used to send out one piece at a time, and you'd save those pieces and put them together, and then you'd color it and send the whole thing back into the world. I have never seen a Boston Globe where you got one piece at a time um, from the newspaper, and then you had to color it and send it back. I've never seen one. Huh. Lots of them, but I'm I, I'm a little um, U.S. centric. I haven't I've I've collected a few of those just incidentally, but I haven't really gone out looking for them. But they're out there. It's it's and in fact, you know, you see these advertising things all the time. You have probably like me gotten um, and the advertising the puzzle shows up as a theme on advertising on a regular basis. The uh, the, you know, I've, I've got, I can't tell you how many of the schools I've been to have sent me a flyer with a piece cut out of it saying, you are the missing piece in our scholarship puzzle, you know, send money. Um, and, and so it, it's still a, a theme that's out there all the time. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I'm just one, curious. one more and then I'll happy, be happy to talk to people individually and we can get a little bit of a break. I remember getting um, lots of things in our cereal boxes when we were growing up. My sisters and I amassed a whole bunch of um, paper dolls. Um, no cereal companies that did puzzles? Cereal companies uh, did, gave away puzzles. Yeah, they, they were one of the first. Okay. Um, and um, come the 50s and 60s, um, they would put little puzzles in their boxes, you know, about the size of that Turkish trophy cigarette puzzle, you know, would be in a little um, uh, uh, glassine envelope right. that, um, so it wouldn't get cereal all over it, sugar all over it. And um, the, the um, and then they also had the send away thing printed on the back of the box. You know, I sent away my, my nickel to get my submarine that would work in the bathtub uh, on baking soda, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the. If you go, if you're interested in advertising premiums, there it's just a, it, it's a, a very wide field, very wide field, and I've only learned mostly about the the jigsaw puzzles. Well, thank you, and I think you have time to stretch before the next show and tells at 10:40. Okay. So, um, so uh, the next event is at 10:40. And uh, so please uh, take your break um, and uh, come back promptly. Thank you.